And uh, thank everyone for joining today. I was going through the waiting room and seeing names pop up. It's great to see a lot of familiar names and friends. And uh, it's also really encouraging to see a lot of names that I don't recognize. So very happy to have you all with us today as we dive into the Long Island Sound Report Card. Um, if you're curious about this picture, it was taken from our um, water quality monitoring group heading out um, to East Chester Bay. This is um, Hart Island with the sun coming up. One of the benefits of going out and monitoring early in the morning. As many of you know that are on this webinar, I can tell we have some of our partner groups on as well. So before we jump into the Long Island Sound Report Card, um, I wanna just point out the report card wouldn't exist without really high quality um, water quality data that's collected um, all across the Sound. So the open water grades, so the Long Island Sound open water grades um, are generated from data that's collected by New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Um, that's our group up here in the upper left. Um, Interstate Environmental Commission down here in the bottom left. And then the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environment, Environmental Protection, that's in the bottom right. I had the pleasure of going out with them last January. I love getting out in the wintertime on the water. Um, those three groups collect all of the open water data that creates the open water grades. The bay and harbor grades, or the bay grades, I should say, that we're gonna be presenting today are collected by our partner unified water study groups. We have quite a few of them on actually. Um, I can't include all now 23 groups in this slide. I wish I could, but I took some highlights and you can see our water quality groups in action collecting data in the Long Island Sound bays. And those data generate the bay grades, which we'll be going over today as well. So thank you if you're on the call, thank you very much. And if you're not, um, Hopefully your ears are getting hot. We're thinking about you. Thank you very much. So we're talking today about the 2020 Long Island Sound Report Card. Um, the Long Island Sound Report Card, well, I should back up a little bit. Save the Sound picked up in a very friendly handoff from the University of Maryland, the Long Island Sound Report Card effort in around 2015. Um, and then we released the 2016 Report Card. That was our first uh, take at this biennial now every two year um, release of the report card. And you can see a running theme here in the cover. So 2016, here we are, this is a New Haven um, lighthouse. Here we are, 2018, another great lighthouse that we picked up on. I believe this one's Green's Ledge out in Rowayton. Um, and then Martin Hain, who's on the call today, digital, digital um, designer extraordinaire, in addition to all his other communications work, put a nice little new spin on the report card cover. Um, kind of brought it up to date a little bit, made it a little more fun, I guess you could say. Um, and this is our 2020 Long Island Sound Report Card. So we've released three now. Um, and this one has execution rock. So anyone that's in the Western Sound like us in our office in Mamaroneck, you've probably passed this lighthouse if you're out on the water. Now I'm not gonna go into a lot of details right now, but I wanna point out that the Long Island Sound Report Card is a four fold this year. So um, hopefully everyone has a copy. If you don't, feel free to request one or go online and, and uh, you know, download one. But this is what the print copy looks like. It's a fourfold. And what we're going to do today is break some of these into sections and talk about what they um, represent, what we're, what we're getting across in the print report card, and go into more detail as well. So this is the inside. And uh, we're all very confident that all the cool kids and, and adults are out there opening this thing up and putting it right up on their walls. We encourage you all to do that. It has a very poster-like format. This is obviously the meat of the report card where we're looking at the grades. I'm gonna zoom in again. Don't feel like you have to um, rec remember every grade here, but this is how it looks when people open it up. And this is really the meat and the grade display. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Martin and our whole team worked on it, but Martin, you really did a extraordinary job with the layout and getting a lot of information, a lot of data and information into four pages. So kudos to you, Martin, for your design team. It's a pleasure, uh, just design efforts. It's a pleasure working with you. So the indicators. So the indicators are those data that I was talking about. So on this left thing, you wouldn't be able to read this here, this bar. Um, they show the indicators. This is just a little bit more blown up, a little bit easier to read. These are the water quality indicators that are included in the report card. So we have our open water indicators. This is another one of Martin's creations, sort of like a Venn diagram of sorts. The purple box here um, represents our four open water indicators. So we have dissolved organic carbon, which is a nutrient indicator, chlorophyll A, um, which is a good thing, right? But too much chlorophyll is indicative of too much phytoplankton or plant matter in the water, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, dissolved oxygen, which is an incredibly important um, 
water quality indicator for aquatic life, especially the aquatic life that need to breathe underwater. As dissolved oxygen levels get low, marine life can get very stressed. And in some cases, it can lead to those large scale fish die-offs that we obviously do not want to see in Long Island Sound or any waterway across the, across the planet. Water clarity is pretty self-explanatory. It's how clear is the water. Um, so those are our open water indicators. And the bay indicators um, aren't all exactly the same. You'll notice we didn't use dissolved organic carbon. It's actually because there's not a very robust data set for dissolved organic carbon. We were able to go back 12 years of DOC or carbon data for the open waters. But for the bays, we do use chlorophyll, water clarity, dissolved oxygen, but we also incorporated seaweeds. Very important in shallow water systems where you can um, assess how much, uh, the mass of seaweeds in them, very important for nutrient impacts. And then oxygen saturation, which I can talk more about later. I don't want to overly complicate this, but I do want to just point out there are a couple indicators specific to the bays and one specific to the open water. And here they are, nice and blown up, right? So you got to see the nice little fourfold. But here are the open water grades, which I want to draw your attention to. The bays are here too, but we will zoom in on these later. Um, and we'll have more discussion on these circles that are uh, around the borders or margins of Long Island Sound. Those are the bay grades. Um, but the open water grades are right here. And in 2020, based on 2019 data, I should point out, the bay grades and the open water based on 2019 data, um, it'd be impossible to do 2020 data because it's still being collected right now, of course. That'll show up in the next report card. Um, the open water shows a familiar uh, gradient of east to west. So moving from eastern Long Island Sound with that A plus that's been holding stable really for 12 years um, and then moving west into this kind of western narrows in, in near New York City and Westchester County and Nassau. Um, we see a gradient of really good, great water quality, which would be expected in the eastern portion of Long Island Sound. It gets great flushing with the Atlantic Ocean. And then as we move, and, and it's not as uh, densely populated as either, obviously. And as we move west, we see a gradient where really good, really it's pretty good too. And then we start seeing the Bs, Cs, and Fs in 2020. Um, population density certainly plays a big role in that. Tidal flushing being more removed from the Atlantic Ocean here. And of course, the Atlantic Ocean near New York Harbor is there, but it has to go through that narrow section. So there's a lot of tidal um, restrictions here, and it doesn't get as much flushing as the open water. Um, and you, I guess that big F does pop out. So why don't we start with that? Although we do talk a lot about the need to protect the A pluses um, and the need to address or restore those F grades. Um, the Western Narrows has been getting an F for some time now, but as you dig into the report card, I won't go over it all right now. Trust me, it's all there at your fingertips and Tracy is gonna go into the Sound Health Explorer, which you can even dive in deeper. Even though this is an F, over the course of 12 years, it's quite literally gone from about almost a zero flat line to about 49. So it's right on the cusp of getting to a D, which we're really, you know, we're hoping that happens soon. Maybe in the next report card, we'll see a D. But this is a, definitely a region of Long Island Sound that needs additional work to get water quality up to par with that can support aquatic life better and just, just an overall healthier um, ecosystem or environment. We did see in 2020 a slight slip in the Western Basin and Eastern Narrows. Um, if you're really a report card follower, you may have already noticed that. We can't say that that's statistically significant. It could very well be due, be due to interannual variability from year to year. Um, it was based on chlorophyll, so we did see more plant matter, which can be fueled by nitrogen, but it can also have temperature, um, temperature can impact it, and some other things that are sort of not related to nitrogen. So we'll know more about that in 2022. Those declines also were not statistical declines. It sort of just barely slipped about a half grade, a little bit more than a half grade. So we'll see what happens there. We're hoping this goes back to uh, uh, B minus or better. And then this also starts improving as well in future years. This could also be indicative of climate change, which is something that the report card does address. As climate change comes and water is warm, we're gonna have to go further to protect and restore waters. Um, it's gonna become more and more challenging. And that's just the reality of it that we need to, and managers need to start understanding. Um, I will mention also, so the main grades in the middle and then each of those indicators for the open water that I talked about represent what we call this pinwheel. So you can see the grades for those as well. So dissolved oxygen got a C. This was actually a big slip. But this usually gets a much better chlorophyll grade. Um, and then on this one, chlorophyll also 
I went down a bit. I see that chat box blowing up and I'm not reading it. So if Martin, if, if I need to stop on anything, you just let me know. I'm, I'm fielding some of the questions, Peter, as I can. Oh, okay, thanks so much, Casey. Sure. I'm yeah, glad to see questions so early. All right, so open water grades, here they are. Um, uh, we will have another opportunity to see them, but again, east to west gradient and uh, poorer grades in the western sound due to the um, challenges that I listed. Now for the bay grades, you can see them around here. Each circle represents a segment, actually. You might notice uh, Norwalk Harbor is here. See how there's three grades in Norwalk Harbor? We split Norwalk Harbor into three segments and provided a grade for each segment. That's pretty important in these bays. Um, more often than not, the inner part of a bay can be more stressed than the outer part. Again, due to, very similar to Long Island Sound in some respects in that tidal restrictions can be problems. Also, those localized pollution sources might be getting into a smaller water volume um, and not flushing out as much. So we did um, split our um, reporting um, segments of the bays into multiple segments. So here, this is just an example. So Inner Norwalk Harbor is actually a pretty um, telling example where the Inner Norwalk Harbor is really struggling, um, but then middle and outer are actually performing okay, right? A B minus, B plus, a little bit of room for improvement, but not so bad when you get out here. Cold Spring Harbor is another one where we see this, where the inner Cold Spring Harbor is receiving an F and the outer is a B. So it's important to break those apart. Otherwise, those Fs and Bs kind of start to meet in the middle and we don't get the resolution that we'd like in those smaller systems. And here are the bay grades. So again, on that fourfold, this takes up a whole page. This is only half of it, actually, um, where we're looking at the bay grades. So these are all the bays, bay segments, I should say that are graded in the unified water study. The indicators run from left to right. So these symbols from left to right are oxygen saturation, chlorophyll, water clarity, seaweeds, dissolved oxygen, and then the overall segment grade. And I mentioned, and I hinted at it at the very least before, this is an environmental health assessment. So it's not human health where we would monitor things like bacteria. It's very specific to environmental health um, and how that'll impact aquatic life and habitats. I won't stick around on this one too long. Um, you're welcome to jump into the website and really dig in deeper. I wanna point out one more thing with the bay grades. I mentioned and thanked those unified water study groups. They're all listed here. So Wiggity Quack Cove, which has become my favorite one to say, I've never even been there to be honest. I, Tracy, we're gonna to have to make a trip to Wiggity Quack Cove at some point, okay? Um, I've probably said it a thousand times over the past five years, but um, you can see with the bay segments are the groups those unified water study groups that are doing the monitoring. So Cush or Clean Up Sound and Harbors, our easternmost Connecticut group does these three bay segments. Ness or New England Science and Sailing Foundation does Stonington and Alewife Cove. And they're all listed. This would not be possible without those groups. It is an absolute pleasure. We love working with the unified water study groups. It's become such a big component of our program and it's a lot of fun. I see Professor Smith is here today from Yale. Um, sorry that we don't have New Haven on yet. You just joined this year, but you'll be in there in 2022 with New Haven Harbor as well. And thank you for joining and everyone else from the UWS that's with us today. Moving on, here's our second set. So this is just, again, it's just splitting that table up so people can actually read it. Um, same thing, left to right. These are our indicators. These are the bays. These are the groups that do the monitoring in those bays. That monitoring, by the way, is all funded now by the EPA Long Island Sound Study, the full program is, and um, it's all conducted under a quality assurance project plan, which is, a, is about as technical as a document as it sounds like it is. Very important though, um, it really makes sure that we're all collecting data the same way, um, and it also um, just kind of brings us together, like I said, all the same way and strengthens the data for uses outside of the report card. So while I'm here showing these bay grades, Connecticut's also received the data that fueled these grades, not just the letter grades, but the actual raw data collected in the fields, and they're using them for their Clean Water Act assessments. Um, New York is a very similar thing where they're using it for a local management plan called LINAP, or the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. Um, and we share it with New York and the EPA as well. So it goes beyond just the report card, which we're talking about today, the data usage. All right, last chance, I'm gonna skip on. One of the more troubling findings that we found um, are the causes of poor grades. So what we're looking at here, dissolved oxygen, of course, very important indicator for aquatic life. As that oxygen gets low, like I said, you can start to see fish die-offs, shellfish die-offs, 
all kinds of bad things can happen to aquatic life. 48%, so just, just under half of the bay segments in the study received a poor grade for dissolved oxygen. That's something we need to improve in Long Island Sound. That's something we need to improve. We have to improve that. Um, and a poor grade, by the way, is a D or an F. So that means that they reached very low levels multiple times um, of dissolved oxygen. You'll hear people say hypoxia, that's low oxygen, um, or even anoxia, that's no oxygen in the water. 48% of the bays in the study reached that um, level a few times um, in 2019. Seaweeds are closely connected to that. Seaweeds, we need seaweeds in healthy environments, healthy habitats, most of them at least, right? So, you know, seaweeds are a good thing, but when there's too much seaweed, um, some of the bays have feet, literally three, three and a half feet of nuisance seaweeds, nutrient-loving seaweeds, that's not good for uh, the environment. It, it can impact dissolved oxygen levels, um, and it also just really can impact aquatic life in many other ways. And those seaweeds are fueled by nitrogen inputs, as is chlorophyll, by the way, algal bloom. So algae encompasses chlorophyll, phytoplankton, and the water floating, but it's also seaweeds in these shallow water systems. That's why it's so important that we had seaweeds in the unified water study as well. It complements the chlorophyll A data. And as you can see, 40% had poor grades for seaweeds as well, which indicates a nitrogen loading problem or excess nitrogen entering the base. So here's the breakdown, like I mentioned before. Um, here's the cover. If you have the print copy in front of you, or if you are gonna read this later, this is an executive summary, um, kind of just what the report card's all about. We all know what an executive summary is. Um, and it also drives us to the Sound Health Explorer, which is a phenomenal, I won't say new, but, but uh, redesigned, kind of re-released tool that we have at Save the Sound. That include, and Tracy's gonna be talking about this, but it includes report card, report card data. It also includes beach data. Um, pathogen indicator data that's collected at our beaches, um, which, you know, basically dictates when they're safe to swim, and then um, coastal resiliency data and uh, sea level rise data. So Tracy's going to dive into that. I won't go into too much, but we do highlight it in the print report card and drive people to it. And here I am doing what I do best, right? Talking and holding cool scientific equipment. I don't get to do that as much as I used to, but I'm out here with um, a great UWS group, the Bronx River Alliance, some of their staff on the Bronx River going over procedures. Um, but this, these two pages include meeting the unified water study. That's the study I've been talking about. Um, and just talking about the groups that contributed to the 2020 report card. Um, and then a really important thing on this, uh, these two pages is taking action. So we could put the grades out there, right? And it's important information for people to have, but Save the Sound really stands behind providing people actionable items so they can do things to, to increase the water quality locally near them. These are things that pretty much all of us can do to some capacity. And we like to put these out there and Tracy's gonna go into actions and challenges in the Sound Health Explorer. So we cover the actions here, but we actually get very specific into challenges to each of the bays and the report card and the open water as well. Um, very important to have actions in here. Um, we're not a doom and gloom company. <laughs> so we got to put the actions in too. We want to empower people to make change. And with that, I think Tracy's going to steal the share screen from me or take it, I should say. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Tracy. All right. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, give you all a quick tour of uh, our website, the Sound Health Explorer, where all of the data that's in the report card lives um, and more, multiple years of the same data and the same types of grades. So, um, you know, the report card is very important in that it gives us an opportunity to um, tell a story at a moment in time, issue grades, capture the attention of the press and the public and have conversations about Long Island Sound and, and pollution challenges and what we can do. Um, and the website as a complimentary piece is there all the time. We can put a lot more data into it. We can do a lot more around um, very hyper local um, findings and actions that people can take. So they're really very complimentary. Um, so I've clicked into our fishable area. We do have these three um, 
uh, kind of data story areas within the site. And today we're just going to look at fishable, but I'll just um, recognize quickly that we do also have a swimmable um, data display, which is really um, all beach data, which is very interesting. I encourage you to look at that. I could take questions on it at the end if people want to, um, but this is um, data collected at over 200 Long Island Sound beaches by the Department of Health, and it goes back um, 14 years. We have 14 years worth of, worth of data there and grades. Um, and in Livable, we have a sea level rise tool and information around the impact of climate um, and some actions people can take to prepare for and mitigate um, the sea level rise we're beginning to experience already in the region. Um, but today we're talking about ecological health. So that's the fishable um, part of the, the uh, tool. And really the Long Island Sound report card is focused on um, ecological health as Peter um, mentioned. So we do add other, you know, the tool is really for both the people who want to do pollution work and um, pollution remediation, but it's also designed to get people out on the sound and help people connect more with the sound as a recreational resource. So in addition to the grades, we have other layers with things like um, the location of boat launches, um, you know, the outline of coastal watersheds. Um, and in the beach section, we have a lot of information about individual beaches as well. Um, but for today, we're going to focus on, um, on the grades and what the report card has told us. So some people have been asking about um, grades over years. Um, in the chat. So um, when you come into the tool, you can switch through this um, timeline at the bottom and see the grades. You can see the Unified Water Study grades disappear because they just started in 2017. But you can see the open water grades, the overall grade change over time. So I'm going back in time here. Um, and you can see that we have made improvements. This is the first year we have the grades for 2008. Um, and then back to, two th I'm sorry, 2000, yeah, 2008, and then back to 2019. Um, but, you know, this is where we start to show trends and, and look at trends. Um, also within this view, and I'm back in 2008 again, you can go into individual indicators and see the actual locations where these samples were taken and what the results um, are by season for each of the um, the location. So you can look at dissolved oxygen, for example, and go forward in time. Uh, we also have included in this tool underneath each of the years, the precipitation, um, total regional precipitation for that sampling season, uh, because there is a relationship between um, some of these water quality indicators and rainfall, rainfall direct correlation. So we're trying to bring more of that um, weather uh, component into the Sound Health Explorer. So, so you can look at these, at each of these indicators individually to go back to the overall health. I'll show an open water segment and then we can look at, um, we can look at uh, one of the Bay or Harbor segments. So you click on it, it gives you the grade and tells you what year you're looking at. And then you can go into each of these uh, regions and again, you can look over time with this view, you can actually see all those individual indicators um, changing year by year as the grades change. Um, and you can also get other views on the data. So this is the summary view. You can also look at um, a chart that's generated that shows each of these different indicators um, fluctuating over time based on the grades. So these are the grades which have a whole um, intense methodology behind them that is also spelled out on the website. I'll, I'll show you where you can see that. Um, but in any case, this is one of the views. We also have a table um, where another way of looking at grades and sorting grades by year. And then if you want to look at the um, raw data, we do have a feature where you can download Excel spreadsheets. You can specify the locations you're interested in, the time frame that you're interested in. Um, so, you know, we're really trying with the design of this tool to make a kind of simple takeaway for the layperson by using the A through F grades methodology and the basic um, color system. But then we're also trying to um, go to layers for people who actually then want to take this data and do some analysis and do some local advocacy um, 
and maybe even download it and do additional work. Um, we also have right now for a limited time, a direct link at the top of the, um, of the website where you can just go right to the download of the, uh, the Beach Report to get that PDF. So now I'll show an example of um, an embayment. So let's look at, um, let's go over here. We'll do, we'll do Outer Hempstead Harbor. So, um, so data has been collected starting in some locations in 2017, some of our early groups, including um, Coalition to Save Hempstead Harbor, we're still getting the 2017 data up, but we do have 2018 and 19 um, for each of our locations. When you look at uh, the individual location, you're seeing a, a Google map that shows you where you are. Um, you also are seeing um, challenges that have been identified with our uh, scientific advisory team. Um, we've used a number of different um, data sets to look at grades and, tr and determine what would be possible challenges that or likely challenges that each of these locations could be experiencing. And I'll show you what it looks like to, to go into one of those and how that links to actions in a moment. Um, we also want people to let us know if there's anything that, that they see that we're missing at any of these locations. So we have a chance for people to talk to us from this local framework on every page. And we have a link out to the monitoring groups that collect the data. So um, if you live in this area and you could give us feedback through the site, but if you want to reach directly out to the group that's doing the monitoring, um, you can also go to their website and um, see who they are and reach out to them through that. So I want to take a moment and show you how the challenges work, because as Peter mentioned, um, one of our main priorities in publishing the report cards and having this site is we're really trying to take the best science and the most current science on the sound and push it out to the public so people are informed and then empowered to do local work because as you see from the grades they really are so local and they're so reflective of local conditions especially in the bays um, we want people to be able to to get this feedback on what could be happening if they're not getting a good grade locally and then specific steps they can take. So, um, so just one example, all of these challenges take you to a page that gives you um, a brief description on what it is that we're talking about. You know, what are the, the algal blooms? Why are they happening? Um, and then we have specific actions that people can take to address them. So with this one, we actually have a lot of actions here. Um, and which is good. So there's a lot people can do and need to do. Um, people on Long Island will be familiar with um, inspect your sewers and your septics and Connecticut, but also um, I'm going to click on upgrade your low pollution septic systems. So there's a big push on right now in Long Island to um, get these um, new septic systems in the ground that also treat um, nitrogen as well as fecal bacteria. So we have a little write up on what that is and then we're link linking people out to additional resources, including to the specific um, program that's being offered in Suffolk County. Uh, so trying to get people from, hey, I'm understanding the conditions locally, what can I do? What's my part? Um, so it's everything from these kind of really personal actions with the house uh, icon to, um, Things you could do from your um, desktop with the um, megaphone like emails and signing up for a mailing list or volunteering that's what our hand one is for here so just one more example uh, if you go into this one you get a little explanation of how you could help by reporting discrete water pollution you might see in your neighborhood we have examples of what is water pollution a little description of some things that that aren't typically water pollution and then we actually link to um, a report that people can fill out on the website and get that information back to us and then we can follow up with them. So I think that's a lot of information. I, you know, I mostly wanted to touch on the high points of um, there's more data here, there's data over time, and there are opportunities to, um, to drill in and um, see some other things that could relate to what's going on and then there's actions that people can take. So a couple other layers we have impervious surfaces, we have the locations and the permit numbers. 
of all the wastewater treatment plants around the sound. Um, we have the combined sewage overflow locations, boat launches. So, you know, trying to reach a lot of audiences and engage people in the way that they care about the sound and they relate to the sound um, with the tool. So we really encourage you to explore it. Um, and with that, I think it's probably time to, to give it back to Peter and then move on to questions. So if you wanna take the screen back, Peter. I think I have one more slide. Oh yeah, so I just wanna close on a final slide that we, um, that we shared with the press release um, when we issued the Long Island Sound report card. And, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of 10 best and worst, but over the years I've learned doing this work that this is what the press wants to know. And even when we don't put it out there, they, they've kind of pulled it out of us in the past. So we've embraced this. And now I, I, my feelings about these lists have changed. And in the context of the report card, I now see this as our call to action. Um, these two lists represent on the left, the places that are pretty close to pristine, you know, in great shape and that really um, need to be protected and preserved. Um, because they are in these great conditions and they also, you know, kind of offer us, um, you know, an example that we can't all get A plus grades or at least, you know, a solid B plus um, uh, if we're able to put the right management practices into place. And then on the right, these are the places that really need our urgent attention. And this is the roadmap for um, our state agencies and our advocacy community. Um, to focus in on these locations and help people in these communities with some of these specific strategies. Um, and that's something that the team at Save the Sound um, is doing. We've already spoken with um, leadership in some of these locations and we'll be reaching out um, in the coming weeks um, and also working with our partners who are already in these locations um, and offering resources to them uh, where needed to help them put some plans into place. And some of these locations I can tell you, you know, already have work happening and good groups there and are already down the path. But, um, you know, these are complicated projects and some of these uh, challenges can be really pernicious and um, it's not an overnight fix. And other ones are just realizing they have problems, you know, now. So everyone's in a different place, but the report card does provide a great opportunity to, um, to shed a light, to motivate some action. And uh, we've definitely been seeing uh, those reactions and that interest in the past week since we released it. So we're very happy for that. Um, and with that, I think we should open it up for, for questions and maybe our resting slide could be the overall um, grade slides, Peter. Yeah. Um, and then happy as we go through the chat box to, um, to go back into the Sound Health Explorer as well and look at some of these locations in detail if anyone wants to do that. And there are quite a few in the, uh, in the chat box um, yes, do you, do you want me to pull those up? So yeah, um, kind of take them in the order that, the, yeah, that'd be helpful. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, so a lot were answered while, while we were going through, but um, is it, uh, here we go. This is from Julie Granger. Um, uh, is this from a single year or a mean of a few years, which we, which this is a single year, but she mentions 2019 was a rainy year, which increase, increases the end loading? Yeah. So possibly you could talk about that? Yeah, well, it certainly could. It certainly could um, increase the nitrogen loading. And I mean, that's the reality of it, right? But it's a single year. So you can go back and check different years. Um, so yeah, I mean, more rain, could it potentially bring more pollutants into Long Island Sound? Um, of course, you have to realize that a lot of the open water grades in particular are driven by um, effluent from treatment plants. Um, so it's, you know, you have, it's not just rain either, you got wind and rain and meteorological conditions. So those can, those can impact the grades. One of the things we're thinking about doing in the future, actually, um, we're already in discussions about not as much um, rain and precipitation, but to start assessing the uh, impacts of climate change and do some susceptibility kind of um, work as well. And that may come out in future report cards to address kind of atmospheric conditions. Um, I, I see another question from Terry Wood. Um, what towns are included in the medium green in the middle? Uh, I wouldn't say your guess is as good as mine because I grew up in that area, but I really would encourage you to go to Sound Health Explorer if you really want the exact towns that are in there, you can zoom in and see the uh, cut points. But it looks like Stratford to, um, 
basically like right before, so uh, Stratford to Norwalk on the Connecticut side. And then um, just west of Port Jeff over to uh, Oyster Bay. So there could be a lot of smaller municipalities. I mean, we know how Long Island is with villages and towns, um, which is fine, but there's a lot of smaller municipalities in there. So please go to Sound Health Explorer and check those out. Um, and check out the bays and harbors too, um, and the municipalities that surround those bays and harbors. There is a good question from Eric, um, which had to do with the indicators. Someone, so I see a lot of questions about the indicators. So one of the things we didn't bring out here, which we, which sometimes we talk about in great detail in different meetings, these indicators were not selected by Just Save the Sound. Um, we had a technical advisory committee of agencies, um, EPA, Connecticut, New York, DEP, nonprofit groups like Save the Sound, all getting together to select the indicators. It wasn't just, um, you know, us picking them. And it was a very collaborative process. It needed to be to get the stakeholder buy-in that we want for this report card. Sure, there's probably, there's hundreds of indicators that could be included, but we needed to get to the heart of it. We needed to look at data sets that are long-term and high quality. And then for the unified water study, we had to be realistic about costs and what we're really looking at. When you talk about aquatic life, dissolved oxygen is really going to be one of the leading indicators, no matter where you are really on the planet when you think about it. Um, so that, that was kind of a no brainer, but the other ones needed to be assessed and we needed to look at how they'd be collected, um, where, you know, and all of that. And in addition, the, the, the thresholds or the grading kind of formulas really, because they're continuous formulas, those were also developed with the technical advisory committee that wasn't just save the sound. And they used um, biological data from um, estuaries um, like Save the Sound and Save the Sound, historic data, actual empirical water quality data from Save the Sound, and um, thresholds from the regulatory community. It was a four-pronged approach to setting the grading scale for all the indicators in the report card. The indicators, um, we did do one change. I think there was a, a question about changing indicators. Um, we did take total nitrogen and total phosphorus out. We, um, and replace them with dissolved organic carbon. And you can read about that. It's a much more stable nutrient indicator closely associated with human sources of uh, nutrients. Nitrogen's a tricky one because when nitrogen enters Long Island Sound, it's often picked up really quick by um, phytoplankton and by seaweeds. So it doesn't make the best indicator to go out and just monitor nitrogen proper. Um, so that's why we have chlorophyll and DOC replaced that nitrogen um, indicator, Eric, I think that might be getting to your point. When we changed it in the open water, we recalculated all the grades back to 2008 for DOC because that data set exists. So it's a continuous line of the same exact indicators from 2008 to 2019. Um, and the unified water study is new, um, so those grades are brand new. Um, they haven't changed. Um, and there was a question. Hey, uh, uh, Peter, let me, let me go through the question. Okay, go so, for it. Uh, so there's a question here from um, John Sargent about Bill Lucy, and he asked about uh, how the Soundkeeper fits into all this. <clears throat> yeah, Lucy, yeah. Uh, well, the Soundkeeper is incredibly involved in this effort. He, was, uh, he participated in those technical advisory committees. He's got a great science background. He's also out and about on the water. He's helped out actually at times some of the monitoring groups. Um, so he is very involved and an integral member of the water quality team at Save the Sound. Um, great. So, uh, Leola Specht asks, I wondered if the COVID pause when people drove less and construction slowed and air got clearer had any effect on the water quality for 2020? That's going to be a tough one to assess. Um, the everyone's still flushing their toilets. <laughs> people are still taking showers. People are still using water. Um, it's still raining. Things are still coming off the road. Water, also, water quality also doesn't tend to just respond as quick as, say, air quality can to something like that. So, yeah, I mean, Less cars on the road, much less, right, from some of the aerial photographs um, could, could make a very serious, like, real-time impact on air quality. We're not so sure about water quality yet. Um, there could be less uh, deposition um, from, you know, nitrogen that comes out of uh, exhaust of cars, but we haven't registered that yet. Um, but that's a really good question and um, one that maybe we'll have more information on and maybe um, some leading scientists in the sound may as well in uh, years to come. Uh, okay, there's also a question about um, what's the impact of motorboats on any of the indicators? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I guess 
<laughs> yeah, you want like to... oil? Were you thinking about like oil or gasoline? Well, oh, those are certainly or... I was thinking more water clarity. I mean, barges yes. certainly. Um, maybe not so much recreational uh, motorboats, but um, certainly in areas where barges are coming up and down, um, in and out of the embayment multiple times a day, um, that could impact water clarity. Um, certainly it does actually, when they get close to the shoreline, it can start stirring up sediments um, and that could certainly impact water clarity. Um, I guess if there's enough dumping, uh, illegal dumping of uh, heads from boats, it could in the long run, but there's probably, that's an, that's an important thing to not let happen but there's probably bigger picture inputs of nitrogen as well that more drive the force like stormwater, fertilizer, septic tanks, sewer discharges, those things are, might be a little bit more of a um, leading contribution than just yeah. say motorboats. Uh, Lori, Lori Malloy also asked a really good question about did the, uh, did the worst 10 cover the New York City metro area? Yeah, you know what, Peter, why don't you bring, the, why don't you bring that um, slide up again? the 10 best and worst. I just stopped sharing. Um, I can say, because I remembered off the top of my head that, um, actually, I guess I could zoom in on the website. But anyhow, let's look at the list. Uh, definitely the East Chester Bay mm -hmm. um, is on the 10 worst. And the Bronx. Um, it might be the worst. And the Bronx River. Um, are you able to get the screen back, Peter? Oh, you can't see. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here. I'll, sh I'll share it from. Uh, like pointing at things. No, here you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you saw right, it. There you go. Yeah. So Inner East Chester Bay is New York City waters and Little Neck Bay is New York City waters in Queens. Bronx River is New York City waters. Um, so that's three. And I think that's, you know, there is outer Little Neck Bay, which did a little better with a C minus. So it didn't make it up there, but certainly in New York City, the C minus was the highest grade um, that was received. Um, and East Chester Bay is one of the places where Save the Sounds team, Peter is out there monitoring and it's a big embayment. So we do two grades, an inner and an outer. And the inner East Chester Bay is um, an F and the outer East Chester Bay is a D plus. And Peter could probably tell you anecdotally how rough the inner East Chester Bay is on a given day, which is where the Hutchinson River um, flows out of Westchester County and then down into East Chester Bay and into Long Island Sound. Yeah. Well, I can just point out our team this year, um, and I actually happened to be out on that run too. We, we documented multiple fish kill events, but one that I was on with just thousands and thousands of juvenile bunker, uh, which are um, forage fish in Long Island Sound, which you'd love to see in bays and harbors. So from this size to this size, just dying, coming up to the, coming up to the surface, gasping for breath, um, and we're pretty much just wiped out. We reported that to uh, DEC, which is the state um, you know, regulatory group, Department of Environmental Conservation. Their response was quick, but it was really a shame to see. Um, it has some of the worst oxygen grades in the whole study, um, where it goes into anoxia, which is essentially no oxygen in the water. Um, and our team does record that um, fairly often in the late summer. So it, it's, in need of, um, it's in need of some restor restorative efforts um, and there's plenty of sources of nitrogen that could be cut down on um, in that area. Speaking of New York City waters, um, just a sneak preview, we are hoping to bring another New York City group into the Western Narrows. Um, so stay tuned for that um, in the Unified Water Study. In the next report card, we might be having another uh, bay in this kind of area of New York City. So hopefully that does come through um, this season. Okay, yeah, we have a, a good question from Michelle. Um, why use turbidity readings in bays and secchi disk depth in open water? What are the thresholds for turbidity and secchi depth? Yeah, is that Michelle Golden? It's Michelle L Lapinel. Oh, Lapinel, okay. McAllister. So, we, I, I think one of the things that's coming that I, I would encourage people that are really getting into the nitty gritty, which I love, right? Um, we're gonna be re releasing a very technical document that goes over the grading thresholds and the formulas and uh, the, all that work that the Technical Advisory Committee put together. Um, SECI is collected in the open sound. There's a time requirement on SECI. So it, need, it really should be collected, I believe it's like 12 to 2 p.m. As part of the unified water study and an important point in shallow water systems, we're not out collecting dissolved oxygen at noon or 2 p.m. All the groups in the study, all the groups that are on this um, webinar know this well, and 
I do too, are out there within three hours of sunrise. That's because dissolved oxygen fluctuations in shallow water are very different than the lower bottom portions of Long Island Sound. They'll go through swings. So if we were out in say outer Little Neck Bay at 2 p.m. doing a Secchi reading and doing dissolved oxygen at the same time, the dissolved oxygen could be very, very, very high. Actually, I've seen it, it could be. But if we go out at seven in the morning and do it, it might be hypoxic. That has to do with those daily swings in dissolved oxygen that occur in shallow waters and in the surface waters of the sound. And what we did to keep it realistic for our monitoring groups is we switched to turbidity, which is another measure of water clarity that can be monitored at any time of the day. Um, and there are conversions, and we outline them in this technical document, between turbidity and water clarity. So while we grade turbidity for the bays, we looked at what that equates to as water clarity, and we actually provided formulas for both. So you can see how it would assess, like, 3 NTU is this many meters in water clarity. So we used um, that met metric. So that just gets to, I think, your point. And uh, turbidity is measured with a multi-parameter sonde, which is an instrument that groups use to collect water quality data. So we're able to collect it while they're doing dissolved oxygen, while they're doing chlorophyll, and then we grade it. Um, it's, a, it's a very valid measure of water clarity. In fact, that's what it is. It's just a different unit, and it has a slightly different way of going about it, and it's not constrained by time. I don't have the thresholds on, on, uh, at the top of my head, but if you email me um, separately, I'll send you the figure. Um, which shows the exact thresholds. They were pulled out with the technical advisory committee considering um, sub submerged aquatic vegetation and based on DEC's input, which was very valid, non-submerged aquatic vegetation water clarity cut points. So um, it, was a, it was a big process actually setting those cut points and setting the formula for the turbidity water clarity grading. So I just wanted to mention um, this, this webinar is being recorded. I've been asked a few times whether or not it's being recorded or not. Um, it, and we will post it to our website probably sometimes next week. That's all the questions we have in the chat so far. If you have any last minute questions, please get them in now. And uh, I saw one more. I saw one more, which was uh, on my mind, which is a super techie one. It has to do with the difference between dissolved oxygen concentration. Oh, right, right, right. Yep. And from Julie or Ju uh, Julie Granger. So it kind of gets to my point, which I just mentioned. All the UWS groups are, or what I just mentioned, I should say, it's not really the point. But um, all the groups are out there within three hours of sunrise. So that's when we're going to catch the lows in dissolved oxygen concentration. I, I trust you, you have some background on it because you're asking a pretty specific uh, question. But um, so it goes down. But like I said, if you were to do dissolved oxygen concentration in the middle of the day in the same embayment, it could be really, really high in the same bay. It could be really high. That's why we don't collect um, DO data at different times in different embayments and different bays, I should say, because it we would lose that comparability like that. Um, but the oxygen saturation is getting at something else. So dissolved oxygen concentration, milligrams per liter. Oxygen um, saturation is a percentage. It has to do with equilibrium and how much oxygen is in the water and um, compared to atmospheric conditions, and it can be heavily driven by primary producers or algae in marine waters, seaweed and phytoplankton. When it gets really, really high, um, it can almost look like the water is bubbling from so much oxygen in the water in the middle of the day. But then the dark side of photosynthesis, which is an evil, of course, like Vader or something, but the dark side is respiration. Plants use oxygen at night. So it can also really quickly swing down, almost like it vacuums oxygen out of the water at night. Now, if we see, if our groups are out on the water and they're collect, they collect oxygen saturation and concentration data, if the water is very saturated with oxygen at 7, 6.30, 7 in the morning, it's very indicative of an issue with algae. Like, if it's gotten to that point that early, it's a problem. And that's why we included that. We wouldn't have done it for the open water, but it's very important for shallow water systems with those big mats of seaweed and, and just a lot more productivity really um, to include that and to, to measure it. Um, so I hope that gets to your point. It is a very nuanced um, kind of question. And again, I, in the technical report, which will be made public, there's a whole five pages on why, why it's included and how we included it. So I just added, um, I just added Martin's email. I hope that's okay with you, Martin, to the chat because uh, I just want to put a pitch out there that 
um, you know, the goal of the report card is to get it out into the public. So if any of the folks on this call, you know, I know some people have, uh, are part of other nonprofits or educational groups or have students or have a library um, in a coastal community. If you have places where um, you think people would be interested in getting copies of the report card, you know, we do have a finite amount, but we'd be happy to put some small batches in the mail, um, you know, at key locations or for events where um, it would get in the hands of people who, who care and want this information. So um, if you have an opportunity to, um, to share it um, or use it educationally, please shoot us an email um, because we'd be happy to send some out to you. And I would also add to that, if, uh, if you feel there are opportunities where we can either present or get the information out to people for your organization or larger groups, please let us know about those opportunities as well. Yeah, and one of the nice things with the Sound Health Explorer tool now is we can also, you know, really drill down and go in more detail on local conditions. Um, so we can tailor presentations to, to local um, communities and interests. Um, so happy to do that. So there's another question that came through about um, is shellfish from John Sargent is shellfish same as fishing where are the WTT labs located to monitor shellfish so I'm going to let Peter talk about the labs I think we're going to see one um, next week um, but in terms of our you know the fishable um, um, framing of the Sound Health Explorer, um, you know, for us and for this report card, we're, we're, we're really looking at measuring that areas of the sound can support fish, can support marine life. Um, we do have on our, on our to-do list to add some more information about um, uh, where the shellfish beds are opened and closed and provisional. Um, Peter's actually working on that data right now and that's gonna get added to the site soon. And we also are gonna be adding some more information about um, fish consumption advisories. Um, again, trying to get to both the people who are doing the management of the location and the, the water resource and then the people who are using it and trying to kind of have both those filters on it. And part of that is so we can get the people who are using it and just want to know what they can eat to actually look at the water quality conditions and if there's a problem, you know, you know, kind of turn them into advocates um, in that process. So we're going to be filling that out more um, on the site in the coming weeks. Um, but with that, I'll pass it over to, to Peter if he wants to answer about um, the labs doing the monitoring. We do not post on this site um, the shellfish um, uh, the monitoring of the, shell, the shellfish itself, um, that data is not included. Yeah, and, a, and an important distinction to make um, is that the report card would be indicative of the habitat health for shellfish. It would not in any way represent, are those shellfish healthy to eat for people? That's a whole different type of monitoring. That's pathogen indicator monitoring and vibrio monitoring. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, completely separate from the grades that we're putting out, which we have explored ideas of using the unified water study data as, um, and we've talked with scientists at NOAA, at the NOAA lab in Milford, um, National Ocean Oceanographic Atmospheric, <laughs> sorry, I won't do the whole thing, but um, administration, but the lab in Milford about using unified water study data to maybe identify locations in the bays that would be good for shellfish restoration, but that's based on habitat only, habitat health. It wouldn't be based on all oh, of those shellfish then healthy to eat. That's based on um, pathogen indicator bacteria. So very separate. Um, and the labs, um, actually Eric Swenson's on with us. I believe the lab for New York, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, um, their FDA approved lab is out near Port Jefferson. Um, and then in Connecticut, there's a Department of Aquaculture lab in Milford. And then there's a state lab at Rocky, um, Rocky Neck in Eastern Connecticut. And that's where the samples from um, shellfish monitoring groups, be it town health departments in Connecticut or the county are bringing their samples for pathogen indicator bacteria. Again, um, separate from the report card though, but a great question to ask. Um, yeah, so along know. that line, I went ahead and threw up the, um, the fecal bacteria data that we have on the Sound Health Explorer. I just took us into swimmable so if you go into the swimmable part of the website, the currently the fecal bacteria data we have is all um, beach data, but it goes back to 2003. Um, 
and it's really interesting uh, to go in here and see the distribution of you know fecal bacteria hotspots and we also have um, in this version of the site we've also divided beaches into you know public and private and residents only so for anyone who wants to look at fecal bacteria which is what impacts shellfish consumption and of course um, swimming hey, there's Trey, a lot there while, while you're there, there's actually a question about, um, Lewis Kleinman asked a question about the two principal things that the public is interested in are, can I swim without getting sick and can I eat the fish that I take out of the water? And if our grading doesn't include that information, does any other group have it? But maybe you could show them how on our site it links out to the public health departments. Um, sure, yeah. So because all the data on our site is historic data, it's not live data. Um, because it takes time to get, get the, the sampling results back. Um, however, we've added a feature on here that links out to the health department that monitors each particular beach. Um, and you'll see there's a current conditions up there on the left-hand side. This one. Yep. Yeah. If you click on that, that takes you out to uh, who you can contact and if they have any messages about um, the, the live conditions at any location. Yeah. So, I mean, in truth, to Martin's point, you know, beaches are managed based on historic data. There's no real time um, monitoring being used on the sound. So the beach managers look at weather patterns. Um, like you can see here, we talk about um, whether or not a beach um, passes or fails in wet weather and dry weather. And then they make open and closed decisions based on if it's raining or recently rained and it's a beach that's susceptible to getting contaminated after rain. Um, but to Martin's point, you know, the closest thing we have to real-time data for the beaches is what each um, county Department of Health is willing to put on their website. So here's an example in Connecticut. So we, we link people out. Right now it's not swim season, so there's really nothing on those sites. But often some of them will have the most recent um, monitoring data. Usually they'll just have, is it open or closed? Um, and the most recent monitoring data is, you know, a day to a week old, depending what time of a week week you look at it. The beaches are monitored once a week and it takes 24 hours to find out how it did the day before. So it's an imperfect science, um, the beach monitoring, but we try and give people some relative information about which beaches, you know, generally do well and how they fare in wet and dry weather. Um, and again, you know, spur, spur local um, activism to make them all A beaches because people hate getting less than an A grade. So part of the part of the um, the efficacy of the tool is to is to build on some of that local pride and sense of competition. We would like for communities to feel like having an A an A grade on this site is like having a good school district. That is something everyone should have and, and work towards. So we have about two minutes left and Lewis has asked a, a very good question, Lewis Kleiman. Uh, is there citizen science monitoring of water pollution as we have in New York City? And if so, what is the group doing it? And we are one of the groups doing it, <laughs> um, but maybe you can expand on that, Tracy. Yeah, so we, so Save the Sound has a large water quality monitoring um, program. We actually have our own fecal bacteria um, monitoring that we do in the Western Sound um, that I can show people really quickly. And then the ecological health um, uh, data that you see for all the bays and harbors, um, that is a big regional soundwide monitoring program that's all fueled by community monitoring. Um, and that includes 23 partner organizations. So when we looked at the, um, at the individual Bay and Harbor grades, um, each of those locations has the group that monitors there. So really similar to the New York City Water Trails um, program. For the Save the Sound um, fecal bacteria monitoring, this is our website and um, we do aspire to get this local bacteria monitoring data onto Sound Health Explorer. But for now, we're really just starting with the Department of Health data. Um, you know, the goal with the Sound Health Explorer isn't just to show Save the Sounds data, it's really to be an aggregate of community data around the whole sound. That's why it's on its own website with its own name. So I think before we put our fecal bacteria, bacteria data into that tool, we'll have a way for multiple groups that do 
uh, fecal bacteria monitoring locally around the sound and we'll try and bring them all in as many groups that want to publish together at the same time. So there's more um, geographic coverage. Um, that's really the goal, the goal of that tool. But you can always go to our website. We have been monitoring um, every season since 2014. Mm -hmm. So a lot of data there as well. Okay, we're, we're out of time. So I want to thank everybody for joining uh, today. Um, again, if you have any questions or you have any follow-up questions or anything, you can send to my email at mhain at savethesound.org. Or um, if you want a copy of the report card, please be in touch. And thanks to everyone who came out and uh, participated in this webinar. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good weekend.